there are risk factors associated with buying new businesses. And I'm sure all of you know that. But when it comes to buying a gas station, these nine risk factors can literally make or break your business long before you even get started with your new business. So you need to make sure, check and verify that will not be the case for you. Stay tuned and I will discuss all about these nine steps. Welcome to the one and only Gas Station Business 101 podcast, where you can learn all the secrets about how to start and operate a gas station business successfully and make money. This podcast is brought to you by the good folks at CSB Academy Publishing Company. And now, here is your host, Shabir Hossein. Welcome to Gas Station Business 101 podcast. I'm your host, Shabir Hossein. And this is episode number 40, the big four zero. We finally are getting someplace. Well, this is the only show of its kind where we discussed how to start, run, and grow a gas station business successfully. And I also share many of the real-life examples and case studies that you can follow and become successful in your own business. This is the first of a two-part series episodes where I will be discussing all about due diligence, how to do due diligence for your gas station business. And I know I have covered this very topic in various other episodes, but I do not think I have dedicated two episodes just on this topic. The reason I wanted to cover this in a two-part series, first reason is lately I have received a few emails from few different individuals that are pretty much at the final stage of buying gas stations and they have asked me various questions regarding this due diligence process where somebody had a question about a balance sheet, somebody had a question about P&L, somebody had questions about some other accounting, some sales data. So I realized I need to summarize all of these under Two episodes where in the future, if you are buying a gas station and you need to come to one place to find all of these notes, it should be right here in episode 40 and 41. The difference between 40 and 41 in this episode, which is number 40, I will only be discussing the nine steps that every gas station business owners should take prior to buying a gas station. These are the business evaluation and cross-reference check and some of the other demographics type uh, things that you need to be checking before you decide to buy that gas station. And in episode 41, I will be discussing something that's usually something that do not fall under typical due diligence uh, checklist. Those are, I call them the hidden risk factors. So that is an important episode as well. But first, we need to see these nine steps where you can figure out if this is a money-making business, if this has a good future for you, and if this business will give you the return on the investments that you're looking for. So if you need to take notes, by all means, do so. And also remember, if you can go to my show notes, I will have the basic points that are I will be covering today. Those will be there, but not much of any other show notes as far as what we're discussing. So if you need to take some notes, feel free to do so. Let's get started. Let me first tell you the nine steps or nine topics that we will be discussing today. Number one the store location, number two, the demographics, number three, the age and the brand, number four, physical inspection of the store, number five, recommended upgrades, 
and how much those upgrades may cost. Number six, indoor issues. Number seven, outdoor issues. Number eight, sales and financials. Number nine, projected PL versus real PL. So let's go with the first item, the store location. If you listen to my previous episodes, uh, many episodes, now we are at the 40th episode. So if you have listened to my other episodes, especially episode number six, where I discussed six P's of marketing. And that was the very first episode of the marketing series. And in that episode, I discussed a lot about place and process. So essentially, this is the same thing, which is the location, the place. If you're in the market, say you're looking to buy a gas station and you contacted the brokers and whoever, they gave you a list of stores and you visit those stores. What do you usually do when you go and look at a store? You look at a lot of different factors, but how do you calculate those factors? What do you see in, in, in those stores? And how do you know if store A is better than store B or if store C is better than store B? Well, I'm sure you use common sense like we all do. But there, there are more things to consider than just using common sense. Because in business, common sense is the most vital thing to use, of course. But when it comes to buying a gas station... There are so many, so much more, so many more factors that you can consider that would make your investment a successful one. For example, as I said, the very first uh, step or the very first item that we need to be discussing is the place, the store location. And I'm sure if you look at three or four different gas stations, you can tell me that store A has a better access better location because it's in a corner it's a busy corner and whatnot but also remember it's not about a busy corner always because if the if the intersection of a city is too busy that can harm your business so the busier is not always the better but there are few things when you look at a location that i want you to consider and i've discussed these in episode six. But again, as I said, in this episode of due diligence, I want to summarize all of these so you don't have to go episode to episode to find bits and pieces. You can come right here at at number 40, episode number 40, and gather all this information. So if you recall from episode six, we talked about a few items when it came to a location. Those items are, how is the indoor lighting of the place. Is the, is the place well lit at night? How is the outdoor lighting? Again, how is that station lit at night? Is it bright, well lit, or is it dimly lit? Th- those come into factors always. But also remember, just because a store is has lighting issue doesn't mean that will break your deal. But you have to make notes of those because those points you can use as part of a bargaining chip. So when you're looking at each place, make sure to take plenty of notes. As I said, like indoor lightings. How is the indoor lighting? How is the outdoor lighting? How clean is the place? Cleanliness. You need to look at that. Restrooms. How are the restrooms? Are they clean? Do they need work? Do they need to be fixed? Or toilet need to be replaced? Items such as that, just keep taking notes. Then you need to look at how is the checkout counter? Is that a clutter-free checkout counter? It's easy for customers to come in and out and pay for their goods and gasoline and and go. Or is it a lot of clutter? Are there a lot of clutter in that checkout counter? Then how is the parking lot? Is that parking lot big enough for people to move around, for the cars to come in and out? without bumping into each other. Then you need to look at the ambience. How is the environment? Is that a friendly, nice environment in that store? Then how is the layout of the product, the gondolas, the shelvings? 
how is the layout does that layout make sense then you can look at the beverage station every gas station has a beverage station and that is one place that attracts your customer in summertime people want soda fountain drinks icy whatever that is and in winter time they want their cappuccino the coffee and that is one area of your store that can attract a lot of customer as long as that beverage station is very appealing then you look at the signage indoor signage outdoor signage how are signage are there too many signs on the windows and doors or is there not enough sign inside the store or outside the store then how is the operating hours just make notes of this and also pricing visibility are products priced in that store let's say you want to grab a bottle of soda when you're grabbing it do you know how much you will pay for that soda are there any prices on that cooler door window a uh, cooler doors or on the shelf let's say you're buying a piece of candy do you know before you go to the checkout counter how much that candy is so these are the things you need to look at this can be your bargaining chips or or these are the items that you know you can improve and grow the business so you can use these notes to your advantage either as i said as a bargaining chip let's say the restroom is broken or the roof is leaking or the signage or the lighting is not well lit you can use those as bargaining chip saying that we need to fix this and it will cost money so i need to offset the price by so much dollar amount that i can fix all those but let's say you did not see enough pricing adequate pricing on the window so you there is no price that's showing how much the bottle of soda is or you see the checkout counter is full of clutters uh, and you see the store is in decent shape but very dirty see you cannot bring these up to the seller because they don't cost money to just move clutters instead these are the notes that you need to hold on to yourself knowing that if you buy the business you can just clean up move the clutters price your merchandise properly and increase the business so these are the chips that you don't want to give out to the seller but hold on to it for yourself so you can grow the business really fast and last thing you need to look at on the location is what is the in and out access of that store is that an easy in and out access and the location if it's a corner one is this at a very busy intersection or not or is it moderately busy or not busy at all as i said at first if the corner the intersection is way way too busy then there are times let's say five o'clock traffic rush or eight o'clock rush people may not get into the store because it's way too crowded on the road for them to get in and not be able to get out in time so it can work as a negative factor if the intersection is too busy sometimes and i do pay a lot of attention to this in and out access and how busy the intersection is next on that list number 2 is demographics and i know i've touched on it in few episodes especially on episode 25 and 27 uh the one of those episodes where i spoke about business plan and in business plan there is a part where you have to talk about the demographics that your gas station is located in and when it comes to demographics as i said before you need to look at the income level the race the age of the population and the mix of the population and also the income level of the population and if you remember i emphasized on few things and i will summarize that for you right here which is a gas station typically thrives in an area that is predominantly more blue collar than white and that is not very high income area that is medium to low income area the reason is if you have gone to a posh side of your town in a neighborhood you walk into a gas station you will see people 
coming in those stations that are white color, they tend to typically fill up their gas, their tank, and if they walk in to inside the store, they may typically buy a candy bar, a soda pop, or just a bottle of water. Similarly, if you walk into a blue-collar neighborhood gas station, you may see a person buying fuel, of course, and coming inside the store to buy a six-pack of beer or 12-pack soda, two-liter soda. Then they may pick up some snacks. They pick up some uh, beer and smokes, uh, tobacco. So they tend to shop more from a convenience stores than a grocery store. I personally prefer to be more in a blue-collar neighborhood than a white-collar neighborhood. And that is why the demographics become very important. Another factor is the age factor. If your station is located at a very older neighborhood where the median age is over, let's say, 55 or 60, then you may not have a good business for a longer time. You need to be in a neighborhood where the median age is much lower because younger population tend to buy more stuff and more goods and more beer, more soda, more cigarettes than the older population. So when you're looking at two or three stores to compare, make sure to take plenty of notes as far as demographics. Again, as I said, just remember those things that you need to write down if store A is in blue neighbor, blue collar neighborhood versus store B is in white collar neighborhood and store C is in a mixed neighborhood and what are the income levels plus what are the race in those neighborhoods and things of that nature. And then you can pick out the best mix out of all of those. Number three on that list is age and brand. And when I say age, it's not the age of the population. It's the age of the store and what brand it carries. The reason these two are important, first, age of the station can tell you that if the station has been established for a long time or not, or if it is too old, let's say it's a 30-year-old gas station, then you may need to worry about other things such as the equipment, the tanks, and all those other things that have been in use for so many years, do they need to be replaced anytime soon? If the roof, roof will have problem anytime soon because the building has aged for many years and it may be time for you to do a lot of repairs to that building, to that roof, to that parking lot, to that underground storage tank or the pumps or the canopy, there can be a numerous thing that can go wrong with an older facility. So you need to keep that in mind. And next comes the brand. The reason the brand becomes important in this case, because as I said in that episode where I talked about branded versus unbranded, that every city, every county, every municipality has one or two very dominant brands. And then there are some that are not so dominant. For example, as I mentioned before, that let's say in our area, Shell is a very dominant brand. And then Chevron would be the second most dominant brand in our city. And then third would be Exxon. But that does not mean that Exxon is the third largest company in the world or or whatnot, but that's not the case. It could be the world's largest oil company, but has a smaller presence in a city. It, it can always happen that way. So, as I said, every city has some dominant brands and some others that are not so dominant. For example, in our city, as I just mentioned, let's say if I'm looking at a station and it is a shell station, then I need to first see how many other shell stations are around this station? If I say there are two other stations within about two to three mile radius, 
then this may not be a good one for me because there are other shells nearby and the credit card holders that holds shell cards, I, will, I might be competing with those stores. But on the opposite end, let's take a look at this way. Let's say Exxon is the third most dominant brand and I'm looking at an Exxon and I do not have any other Exxon in two to three mile radius. Then that is a good thing for this location because I know that I will be the only one accepting Exxon credit card in this area. And I know how strong of a brand Exxon is, even though they're the third in dominance when it comes to our city, but that is fine. As long as I know I'm not competing with another Exxon nearby. To me, that is more important than anything else. So that's why brand becomes more important. You need to see the brand and see how many others are nearby. Now, what if you're, you're looking at a store that is unbranded? That's fine. I like unbranded stores because a lot of times it gives you an edge when you're trying to compete with other branded stores nearby because you can sell your fuel for a penny or two less than your competitors without them trying to match and undercut you because they know unbranded stores will sell fuel at a cheaper price because they're unbranded. They buy fuel at a cheaper price. So if you are a unbranded station and within two mile radius, let's say there are other four other stores, all of them are branded, then that gives you an advantage over those stores because you're the only unbranded store in that area that can sell fuel for a penny or two cheaper. But let's say you're unbranded and there are two other unbranded stores very nearby. Then your edge, the advantage is no longer there and that is not good for you. So these are the things that you need to consider and again, take plenty of notes. Number four on that list is physical inspection of the store and talk about the issues that you notice. Remember when I said we spoke about location and I said look at all the things from lighting to sales floor to restrooms to everything else. This is the inspection where you write down all the things that you see that are wrong with the place that needs to be fixed. And we need to use this to reduce the price. This is the bargaining chip that you need to be using to reduce the price. Not only that, if you have a list and let's say your seller did not bargain, did not want to bargain, did not reduce the price, you still need to get those fixed. So under due diligence, this is one important thing you need to do, which is find out what are the items that needs to be fixed or maintained or upgraded or replaced. Because when you buy a business, you want to make sure that everything is working properly. So this is a vital thing for you to take a note of. And as I said, in the event you can use these, this list as a bargaining chip, by all means you can do so. Number five, recommended upgrades and how much those upgrades would cost. Well, any gas station I go to and I look at, I know there are things that needs to be upgraded. For example, recently as, we, as I spoke in previous episodes that there were upgrades, EMV upgrades on cash register systems. And then there will be another upgrade coming, the same EMV upgrades that needs to be done on the dispensers, the fuel dispensers. Then there are LED upgrades, the lights on your canopy, under your canopy and the area lights, the pole lights, and then the interior, the, the inside the store, the lighting. All these can be upgraded. For example, you visit a store and you see that the canopy lights have been upgraded to LED, but the interior lights, the inside lights have not been. Take a note of that because this is, again, one list that you need to know what needs to be upgraded and especially which upgrades are required by your brand and which upgrades are required by the government, for example. See, if you are in Florida 
or in any other states that recently have gone through some mandatory upgrades on the tanks. I believe it was about three or five years ago when state of Florida finally finished all their upgrades. They gave all the store owners, I believe, five to six years time frame to upgrade every underground storage tanks. The tanks where we hold the fuel to be upgraded from metal to double fiberglass. And this is a very costly upgrade. It can cost you upward about $100,000 or more, depending on how many tanks you have. And state of Florida finally finished doing all that only about three or four years ago. So if you're in a state, you need to find out, let's say if the facility is 20, 25 years old, are those tanks needs to be upgraded because it's a state law in your state. You need to find that out. And that's why you need to know what upgrades are coming your way. I don't want you to buy a store and six months later you find out you have to spend $100,000 upgrading those tanks. You need to know those beforehand. And not only that, as I said, your brand requires you to do a few things as well. Just like I mentioned, they wanted you to upgrade the register system, the POS, the point of sale system. What else are they requiring you to do? And if you know this ahead of time, again, you can talk to the seller and bargain with him or her for that matter and say, listen, I need to do these upgrades. So you need to give me a slack on the price so I can justify buying your business. Next on the list is indoor issues. And number seven is outdoor issues. Again, we will go back to number one, which is the store location. Remember again, those seven or eight items that we talked about. This is where they come in. What are the issues indoor? And what are the issues outdoor? Anytime you buy a house, I'm sure you hire a home inspector then why not do the same here and hire a inspector that can check the roof, for example. And we have had a lot of issues with gas station roofs. The reason is gas stations typically have a flat roof. It's, it's not designed like a house. So a flat roof a lot of times can hold a lot of water. And if the drains are clogged, it can end up leaking inside your store. Then similarly, there are a couple of other issues that most gas stations face. One is electrical problem. See, most of the time a store, these are commercial buildings, so they are built better than houses. But over time, we add a lot of things to gas stations, a lot of electronics, a lot of coolers, a lot of refrigerators, a lot of electronic devices that can put a load on your electrical system and at one point your electrical system may need to be upgraded. So these are the things you need to be checking. Somebody certified, somebody who knows how to do this needs to inspect the electrical system to figure out if that electrical panel box is enough to supply the power into all these electronics that are running in a store. See, if they're not, then your breakers will be tripping and your AC may not work. Your things may break down very often because of the power fluctuations and whatever and whatnot. Then you also need to check the plumbing and make sure that the plumbing is working properly in that store because a Typical gas station can bring a lot of people through their doors and to those restrooms that are used heavily. So there are times you may have problem, especially if this store is located in a place where there is no city sewer system and you're using your own tanks, then you need to find out the health of those sewer tanks and if they need to be replaced or upgraded and things of that nature. And when it comes to outdoor, there are a few things you need to be checking and have it done professionally, especially your dispensers and the tanks. Let's talk about dispensers first. The dispensers can be old and 
may need upgrades. How would you know that? Well, if you hire a contractor that works on those pumps and dispensers, they can tell you, looking at the model number, how old they are, and if there are parts available to fix those anymore or not. I have come across a few times where I walked into a gas station where those pumps are so old that the parts are not really available a lot of times. And there were times we just ended up replacing those dispensers. So, And these are expensive and costly repairs or upgrades. So if you can hire somebody that can tell you that these are the health conditions of the dispensers or the underground storage tanks, you will sleep better at night knowing what you are dealing with. So this is why you need to make sure you do this important in and outdoor due diligence. Next on that list is the next two are the most important ones, of course, sales and financials. And the last one is projected PL versus real PL. I will touch on both at the same time. When it comes to finding out the sales and the financials of the business, of course, you first look at the business and I'm sure they provide you with some type of financials. Could be a PL, a balance sheet, and some sales figures. And typically, you will notice that the gas stations provide you with monthly sales figures and they add it up to a yearly figure. It's easier for me to calculate monthly figures because I can see how much they're doing per month for and if they're making money every month or not. There are stations that do very well in summer and really bad in winter. And at the end of the year, when they do yearly, it may show you profit at the end of the year. But I need to see if that store is making money every month. I don't want to make money only three months out of the year and lose money for other nine months. So I am more comfortable seeing monthly numbers. Whatever they provide you, look at those first and then figure out what else you need to be asking them. I usually, and I'm sure I spoke about this at least in three different episodes, where I know I ask for the daily sales for a month. And then randomly for other months, I would say, give me from 17th through the 23rd of August, and then June 1st to June 15th, random dates. So I can see how they're doing at different parts of the month and different months for that matter. And I also ask them for the vendor's receipt. What I mean by vendor's receipt is the inventory that they buy from different vendors, from beer, cigarette, soda, gasoline, to every vendor that they buy from. I want to see those receipts, those invoices, so I can add them up and see if that complies with what they're selling. For example, if a station, a gas station business, bought $10,000 worth of soda from Pepsi and Coke in one given month, then knowing that Pepsi and Coke makes about 30 to 33% profit margin, soda typically has 30 to 33% profit margin. If I know that profit margin ahead of time, then I can safely say that their sales for that month should be right around thirteen to $14,000 in the department of soda, provided that the inventory level, level stayed the same, which it tends to do when it comes to a typical gas station. Now, if I look at their sales for that month and see that they only sold $11,000 of the soda, then that would make me raise the question, either their pricing is wrong or they are buying more than they're selling or there are products being stolen. On the other hand, let's say the sales figure said they sold $15,000 worth of soda and their invoices tell me they only bought $7,000 worth of soda. I will not be happy. I will be more cautious thinking they're fudging the numbers. Because you cannot buy $7,000 
soda and sell it at 14,000. There is not a 50% profit margin on soda. So that means there is something wrong. And I need to find out what is wrong. So see, doesn't matter what they provide you, a P&L, a balance sheet, a tax return, the real numbers are always inside those cash register receipts, the daily closeout papers, the sales, and the purchase invoices. Those are the actual data you need to look at. And that's what I usually always look at. I look at their P&Ls, but I don't pay much attention to that because I know how you can manipulate those numbers so very easily. But one thing you cannot manipulate is the invoices. If that invoice came from vendors such as Budweiser, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Miller Beer, you, I'm sure, know that nobody can fake those invoices. So unless you're selling those products, you won't be buying it. So if you're buying certain amount of product, certain dollar amount of product, you need to be selling that at certain profit margin. And if you recall from my previous episodes, I gave you a list of profit margin, standard profit margin by departments. And if you recall those, for example, as I said, soda is 30 to 33%. Cigarette is anywhere from 13 to 17%. Tobacco is anywhere from 25 to 30%. Beer is anywhere from 17 to 25%. And so on and so forth. Grocery, 35%. Motor oil, 45%. Fountain and coffee, right around 50%. That's average. That's typical. And there are stores that do outside this norm. It could be much lower, much higher, depending on how they price their merchandise. But typically speaking, this is the range of profit margin. And when I said motor oil at 40%, doesn't mean it has to be exactly 40%. It could be anywhere from 30, 35% to about 50%, depending on how they price it. But it should be right in between there. Now, if I see somebody, a store, buying X amount of product on a category, knowing the profit margin, I can just multiply and tell you the sale should be around this much. And if it falls or goes above or beyond that point, then there are questions I need to be asking the owner about why this is out of range then he or she can tell me either that the pricing is not where it should be or the profit margin is much lower than what I'm anticipating or it is much higher for that matter. And if I see that to be the truth, then okay, I know there is no other hidden agenda other than a wrong pricing strategy, which I can fix very easily, by the way. So as I said, when it comes to doing due diligence, on the financials. And I recently, yesterday, I just answered an email about this very topic. The gentleman asked me, he's about to finalize a deal and he asked for a tax return, I believe. His accountant asked for a tax return and the seller refused to give them the tax return. He asked me, how important is it to have that tax return? And my reply was, not so important. Why? Because Tax returns are something that can vary person to person because if I have, let's say, I own this gas station and I have assets in that store that I'm taking depreciation cost over seven years. Depending on how aggressive I want to be, I can take more depreciation in one year and show little or no income than the previous year or vice versa. So, to when a third party looks at a tax return, they may say, oh, well, he's not making much money. Well, tax returns are not the way to tell if the business is making money or not because there are so many other factors, accounting factors that come into play when it comes to a tax return. Similarly, balance sheet. Well, a previous owner's balance sheet may have a loan that they have taken from somebody and that loan would show up on that balance sheet and on the tax return that can make the tax return look out of the norm, meaning it can show too much profit or no profit or very little profit. So again, for me, that will not matter because 
those loans or depreciation costs are not something that I that are tangible that I can hold on to. And I may not have those. I may have my own depreciation cost, but I may not have a loan or not the loan that they have. So my tax return would definitely look different than theirs. So why would I look at theirs and try to figure out how the business is doing? No, that's not a good idea. But P&L, on the other hand, should give you a much clearer picture of a business. But again, that number can be manipulated as well. So what is the best way to do due diligence when it comes to a retail business? To me, the sales versus purchase. If you're not selling any, you will not be buying anything. And if you don't buy anything, the business is not running well. That means you're not making money. So my main focus is how much are you buying? Let me see your invoices. Then I focus on how much are you selling? And then I look at their profit margin, department to department to department, and make sure they fall in line. And again, if they don't, I know I can fix that. But as long as I know they're buying the product. If they're not, as I said, then they're not selling much. So why would I be looking at a store that's not buying much of a product? So as I said, the last item is P&L. So if they give you a P&L, and I'm sure most sellers provide you with a P&L, look at theirs, but don't think of it as the ultimate deciding factor. Instead, if you go to my episode number 23, you will see where I did a case study, a real life case study, where I showed you what the previous owners provided versus what we projected. Based on the due diligence that I have done, I projected some P&Ls for a store and I believe we achieve that projected PL. So the reason I'm telling you this, because once you are finished with your due diligence, you should be able to create a projected PL. Because I'm sure whenever we go to buy a business, we have a vision for that business. We say, you know, we after we take over, we'll work hard, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll improve this, we'll add this, we'll eliminate this. And by doing all of those, we will be profitable or we will increase the sale by X amount of dollars or we will make X amount of extra dollars. Whatever that case is, put it in a piece of paper. Create a projected P&L so you can show your investors. If you have investors or if you're applying for a bank loan, you will have to have this because your bank will require you that as part of a business plan. They want to see how you will grow the business. So it is for your benefit to, let's say, if they provided you with a PL, you can still create one of your own based on the current sales and expenses. The next thing you do is create a PL that you think you will achieve in three months or four months or five months. And then this will work as your goal that you need to achieve that goal in that amount of time. So you can start doing the repairs, the upgrades, the changes that you need to be doing to get there. And after four months, you can try to create an exact PL and see if it matches the projected one that you've created. That will give you a measure of success. And again, go back to episode 23 and episode 29. This will give you an idea what I'm talking about because we have done exactly the same for a business. And I've showed you the exact P&L. And again, it's not a made up thing. It's a real store, real case study. So you can see how the owners got there. And I believe they even exceeded that projected P&L at one point. So this is very vital for you to do. And again, when you're doing all this financial things, one more thing you can do is ask your sellers about the expenses that they have. There are some expenses that you will have exactly the same as they have. For example, the utility bills. They may not go up or down just because the ownership has changed. Payroll may change because you may 
hire a manager or you may fire a manager and work yourself as a manager, whatever the case is, there are some expenses, fixed or variable, that may change and some of them may not. So you need to figure out what the expenses you will have. Write those down because you will need that for your PL as well. But also you need to find out if they're making money right now or not. So based on the research that you do, based on the purchase invoices versus their sales, create a PL right now and see if this PL that you just created, based on the data that you have, does this match the PL that the seller provided you with? And if it doesn't, why not? Talk to the seller. Say, you know, my number's coming up such as this. Your numbers are this. Why is there a difference? What is, what are you doing differently to achieve that number? Well, I'm, I'm, hopefully I was able to make myself clear as far as how you can figure out if a business is making money or not. But more importantly, as I said, you're not looking at most likely one store. You're looking at multiple stores. So why not make plenty of notes and then at the end of all this due diligence, sit at home and figure out and pick out the best one based on all these points, all these criteria, all these steps and see which one has good potential as of right now and five years from now. And seven years from now, 10 years from now, remember when you're looking at the location, the age and all that, the demographics, you also need to find out part of demographics that I forgot to mention before. Is this a part of town that is still growing or that is declining? You know, there are population shift in every city. If you ask anybody that's 60, 70 years old, they may tell you that part of the city used to be booming, but right now the population has decreased in that area and people are moving towards a newer area. This is called population shift. Every city, every state, every locality goes through this. So you do not need to buy a store where the population is already shifting to a new location or to a new area you need to pay attention to that because then you will always be fighting an uphill battle and not an easy one. Well, if you have any question, feel free to email me at shabir at gasstationbusiness101.com and if you haven't subscribed to my newsletter, by all means do so as I have started to send out those important emails that I told you a couple of episodes ago. The first one went out about five days ago. So if you haven't signed up, please do so, and you will still receive the whole chain of emails. So every new sign up will get will start from the first one. And I have a Facebook group. So in case if you are on Facebook and you have a question that you need to ask me, you can ask me right there. And the best way to get to my Facebook group is type my name, shabirhossein.net. This is a domain redirect that I have. I redirected this domain to my Facebook group. So, and it's easy to remember. So just type shabirhossein.net and it will take you to my Facebook group. And please, if you're listening to this episode and you know how important due diligence is, make sure to listen to the next episode, which hopefully I will have published within a week. Take care and I will see you in next episode. This has been the one and only Gas Station Business 101 podcast with your host, Shabir Hossein. This podcast was brought to you by CSB Academy Publishing Company. Be sure to join us next time as we share with you the secrets about how to start and operate a gas station business successfully and make money.